Thank you. I thought we would begin just with the reading of a psalm. If we can do this together, if you can see that small print, maybe the sides are bigger, but if we can do this together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all you his angels. Give praise, all you his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all shining stars. Praise him, highest heavens, you waters above the heavens. Let them all praise the Lord's name. For he commanded, and they were created. Assign them their station forever. Set an order that will never change. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all the deeps of the sea, lightning and hail, snow and thick clouds, storm wind that fulfills his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, animals wild and tame, creatures that crawl and birds that fly, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all who govern on earth, young men and women too, old and young alike, let them all praise the Lord's name. For his name alone is exalted, his majesty above earth and heaven. He has lifted high the horn of his people to the praise of all his faithful, the Israelites, the people near to him. I like to start with this psalm because it encapsulates, I think, what my, ultimately my talk is about and what the, science of, what the study of science should also be about, is that it's an avenue, as we've heard throughout this semester, this, semester, this, this course already this, this week, about how science should lead one to a deeper praise of God. And so just a little bit of an exegesis of this psalm, on the left-hand column is everything that's above the heaven, or above the earth. Right, all the stars, the sun, the moon, the angels, and there's, if you identified them, counted them, there'd be seven of them, right? this perfect number of things above the earth. And on the right-hand side, if you counted up all the different elements that are praising God, there'd be 22, and there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Right? If we're doing this in English, we'd have 26. Right? So representing the totality of everything is praising God. I think one question for us is, do we praise God for all these things? Heat and humidity, praise the Lord, right? It's, <laughs> is, this, is this part of what we do? So I want just to develop more of my own biographical background that I think plays into this, this talk is, I went to Notre Dame as a biology major, and I spent three wonderful summers at Notre Dame's biology field station in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It's called the University of Notre Dame Environmental Research Center, or UNDERC. And so, there are 27 lakes and bogs up there, and you can do whole lake experiments. So here's St. Paul Lake that I, that I worked on. It's separated by a culvert from another base in St. Peter right across the culvert. And you can manipulate those, those lakes and do whole lake studies. So here's a satellite image of, of that area. The border, this, this line is Wisconsin in the south and Michigan to the north, so it's right on the border. And so that's, that's that same border running through. So there's lots of bogs and lakes to do research on up there. And that really formed me as an ecologist. I left Notre Dame, went to Virginia Tech, and got a master's in stream ecology. I studied small mountain streams in the north and the southwest corner of North Carolina at Coweta Hydrologic Lab. It's part of the National Science Foundation long-term ecological research uh, system. I also got the opportunity when my professor went out to Montana to go out with him and spent a summer at Flathead Lake Biological Station and did some research up in Glacier National Park. And I actually, I was applying for the seminary at this, during that end of that, and so I actually did some streams around here. That's my professor, Gary Lamberti. Um, when I finished at Virginia Tech, I came back to Notre Dame, was ordained for the priesthood, and always thought that I would teach biology. So I began a doctoral program in entomology, the study of insects. I was going to name new species of caddisflies, these aquatic insects, from the tropics. But I left all that glory behind to become a theologian. So instead of being a biologist to think about God, I'm a theologian who thinks about insects and plants and water and those kind of things. So let's think about what is your relationship to creation. So I'm gonna have, I think I have five questions. Don't yell out any answers. We'll go through, we'll go through all the questions and then we'll come back and see how we, how we did. Now the first one hopefully everyone will get because Stephen Barr has given us this answer in one of his talks. 
But how old? What's the age of our universe? Okay, so that's the first question. No, do, hey, remember the rules. Don't yell out any answers. <laughs> we'll go through all the questions. What's the current phase of the moon? How many known species are there on planet Earth? How many have we, have we given a name to? What's the name of this tree species? And then this is a blue dasher dragonfly, uh, Pachytoplex longipennis. This is the male, this is the female. What's the relationship of these blue dasher dragonflies to Jesus Christ? <laughs> it's kind of the response I get on the first day of my classes. <laughs> what, is, what are you talking about? So let's go through. What's, what's the age of the universe? 13.8 billion years. And I think it was just upgraded from 13.7 to 13.8 a couple years ago. What is the current phase of the moon? So it's not waxing, it's, it's the other side. So it's just a new, it was just a full moon last night. <laughs> so now we're on the back side, so it's a waning gibbous that if we could have seen it in yesteryears when I've taken pictures of waning gibbous moons that are about this size, that's what it would have looked like. So it's getting smaller, smaller on the right-hand side. How many known species are there on planet Earth that we've identified, roughly? Okay, I hear 1.2, 1.2? 1.2 <laughs> Some of the squares. So, yes, yeah, so you're right. So these are all species from campus. If you've ever seen a green bee, we have them on campus. So there's about 1.5 million species. In the terrestrial system, there's about 1.25. And then in the oceans, there's about 200,000. So about 1.5 million species have been given a name. But we think there could be up to almost 9 million on the, on the terrestrial systems and another 2 million right, on the total in the ocean, so about 11 or 12 million, perhaps, total, and we've got 1.5 of them. Most of those species, here's a breakdown of what those species are broken into by category, and you can see mammals are, are small, with just 4,800, about a quarter of those are bats. Most of what makes this up are the arthropods, and particularly the insects, so everything from the grasshoppers to the flies or the insects, with the most species being the beetles, which led I think it was an atheist, agnostic um, geneticist, J.B.S. Haldane, back in the 1920s and 30s. Supposedly, he was asked by a group of theologians, J.B.S., you study the natural world. What might we learn about God from studying nature? And he supposedly quipped, God had a fondness for beetles. <laughs> Anybody know your tree species from... Okay, this is the tulip poplar. This is the state tree of, of Indiana, the tulip poplar. This is on campus. They just stopped blooming about a week or two ago. And then the rest of the talk will be the kind of the answer to this question. What's the relationship of these blue dasher dragonflies to Jesus Christ? Right, so that's what this talk will, in some way, this will, they will definitely answer that shortly. <laughs> so in thinking, so this is about evolution and faith, and the, I didn't translate the theory of physica. That just means the contemplation of nature. Theory is contemplation, physica, we had physus, nature, physics out of that. So what's the context when we're, when we're working with our students? What's our context when we study evolution? So I just want to give three responses that I've received from students for the context of, of, of this. The first is I never learned that one could encounter God in anything other than people. Man, that's a direct quote from a student. I had previously mostly experienced religion as sitting in church. So we'll talk about the relationship between being an indoor Christian and an outdoor Christian. And then you may deal with this robustly in your classes. I was raised Catholic, but in high school I encountered Darwin and became an atheist. And we'll talk about what's, what is he presuming about different types of knowledge and different types of divine causation here, right? Thinking back to Corey Hayes' talk, right, he's presuming that a divine cause is incompatible with a natural cause. So here's the outline for what I want to do. Talk about what are these aspects of studying creation pedagogically? What is a contemplation of nature? How do we get to know it? The sacramental vision that, that Corey Hayes had talked about. And then just spend some time talking about epistemology. How do we know things? What are different ways of knowing? And then we'll talk about the nature of God. Who is God? And how does God act? And what's the relationship between God's action and nature's actions? And then we'll apply all this to evolution with a particular look at, at William Paley's argument and responses to that. 
by atheists and theologians, talk a little bit about the intelligent design movement that's already been mentioned a bit already, and in the midst of all that kind of theological reflection responses to them. So theory is a physica, the contemplation of nature. We live in an age of what's called nature deficit disorder. If you're familiar with that phrase, it was coined by the author whose name is just, I'm blanking on right now, but Last Child in the Woods is the title of the book. And right, we live in urban areas, technological worlds, and we, we are so distant from nature that we don't know what a toilet poplar tree is, for example, if you come from this area. Right? It's, so what I try and instill in my students is how do we overcome that? So here's from the early, early church, church fathers of Agrius Ponticus is speaking about St. Anthony of the Desert, right, the founder of Western, founder of monasticism. And he says this, one of the sages or philosophers of that time came to Anthony, the just, and said, Father, how can you endure being deprived of the comfort of books? And he said, my book, philosopher, is the nature of beings, and it is there when I want to read, it is there when I want to read the words of God. It's expressing this idea of the book of nature. There's God's words in scripture, the book of scripture, but there's also the book of nature that God gives us, that we can know him through the words of creation, of all the organisms and mountains and rocks, right? everything that exists are speaking words about, about who God is. So how do, we, how do we get to know those words? And as we've, as at least two people have already mentioned, right? this comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, 120. I think Corey talked about this. This is also drawing upon what Stephen Barr referenced in two of his talks, I think, which is Wisdom 13, verses 1 through 8, and it goes through, so I'll just put this up. He's, since it's already been talked about, you can pursue this. One can encounter God in and through creation. Right? Whether one is, uh, right, this is open to any human being, can encounter God in and through creation. And one is foolish, wisdom says, if one doesn't. So how do we, not, how do we grow in wisdom to see God in and through creation. So I want to talk about a pedagogical process that I use in my class to help the students overcome this nature deficit disorder. So I have what's called the tree project and the moon project. And I tell them with the moon project, this is just a fourth grade project, all you're going to do is you're going to track the moon for a month. So I give them a sheet and whatever the starting date is, and for one month you'll go out every day or night and look for the moon and just sketch what it looks like. And then they'll reflect upon, they'll have a reflection paper upon that. And then a longer project is the tree project where you, they pick a place on campus that has a tree in it, which, which there are many places. And then you observe that place for 10 to 11 weeks and I give you this sheet, you make observations, what's the angle of the sun above the horizon? What's the compass direction of the sun? And then there's what other, what else do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? I said, be careful with taste. And then I give them a question that we're, relates to what we're doing in class that gets them to think theologically upon what they're doing out there. So it's not just looking at trees, but it's a guided reflection upon God's creation. And these two projects transform, are transformative for the students because they learn that this isn't just about looking at trees. It's also about just being silent and still and getting conditions for prayer if they're apt for that to think about another organism, to think about another thing other than themselves, and to be deprived of technology, right? No phones, no computers, right? Just observe, just be out there. And it's amazing what that does. It's very painful for them at times because they're always fidgeting. They want their phones because they're addicted, right? It's an addictive culture. But by the end of it, they'll say things like, I thought this was really hokey in the beginning, but I've come to see this as the best time of my week because I can just sit and be quiet. And it's an over, they pride themselves on being overworked and, and busy. And so just to be able to, what we might have grown up with, of just having time for ourselves and being silent, right? We had to teach them to do this. So those are two ways to overcome this nature deficit disorder, just to pay attention. I never knew this moon could be out during the day. That's a direct quote from a college student, best and brightest in the country. They just discovered that uh, at Notre Dame. So I have them go out into the world. So I teach a class on science, theology, and creation. If they're going to study creation, they should be out in it. They shouldn't just be reading about it. They should be experiencing it. And then I bring creation into the classroom through what I call the logos of the day that I'll get to in a, in a second. But I'll take a picture of some organism from campus, and I'll try and identify it as best I can. I can do all right with the insects. I'm pretty good with insects. So this is a beetle, the coleoptera. And this is a... 
Odia Rankis Wakandas, this is the, the black vine weevil. So it looks like this. It usually comes out in our science of rock and you find it on the sidewalks during the summertime. And I'll try and give some of its biology and ecology things about it. I can't help but to give this one because it's, this is what's out lately. Uh, is this, and sometimes I don't know exactly what it is. I can get it to a certain level, but I can't go any farther. So this is uh, an ostracod. And ostracods are these little tiny crustaceans. So I have a favorite puddle on campus. So this is an ostracod. Here's my favorite puddle. And these are all the little ostracods that are swimming around it. They're just about like a millimeter in size. You can see them with your eye. But I have access to my microscope in the lab, so I can take it in and take pictures through the eye lens, right, the eyepiece of the microscope. So this is what it looks like. These are the antenna. It has two pairs of antenna. They're called uh, seed shrimp. But here's, if we change the lighting, you can see more of the internal structures. So it just gives them a sense of what are different organisms just out there that they would never see, but that's all over the place, with right? this diversity that leads to wonder. So that's called the logos of the day. So I start every class with that. But why I call the logos of the day? Well, it's because of this. Because of this. this comes from John's Gospel. Now, what is Jesus Christ doing at the fourth and fifth day of creation? In John's Gospel, right in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything came to be in and through the Word. It's through God's logos that creation comes into being. Well, that logos, the Creator logos, became incarnate of the Virgin Mary. Right? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, 114. The Creator Logos is the Incarnate Logos. It is Jesus Christ. Everything has a relationship to Jesus Christ. The Blue Dasher Dragonflies have a relationship to Jesus Christ because they're being created in and through him. We often don't think of Jesus Christ in that way. We think, oh, Jesus died on the cross and saved us. Well, no, he's the creator of the universe. And he's creating everything right now. Right? God the Father creates through the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's more developed in the Eastern Church, but... That creator logos implants in each thing a small l logos. So this comes from Maximus the Confessor in the 6th century, I think, 7th or 6th century. Christ, the creator logos, has implanted in each thing a logos, a thought or word, which is the divine presence in that thing, God's intention for it, the inner essence. Right? It draws us toward God. This is how we have the book of nature. There are these little words, these logos, right? It means word, reason, understanding, right? There's these little words in everything. And so Calistus Ware, who's writing about Maximus the Confessor, continues, by virtue of these indwelling logoi, the plural, each creative thing is not just an object, but a personal word addressed to us. Now, if you've read Laudato Si, Pope Francis uses that same kind of language to talk about creation, right? There's a message that's given to us. But all these logoi inherit in Jesus Christ as... And in this fa fashion, acts as the all-embracing and unifying cosmic presence. Everything in the universe is, is connected into who Jesus Christ is. Now, this is not just unique to Maximus the Confessor, in a sense, right? This comes out of Scripture. So if you think about the letter to the Colossians, 1, 15 to 20, on the left-hand side is everything dealing with creation. And one, two, three, four, five times, maybe one, two, three, four or five times, all things are created in and through the Logos. On the right-hand side is redemption. All things are reconciled in and through Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ who is the creator Logos and also the Redeemer. Creation and redemption go together. They're not meant to be separated. In God's divine economy, his plan of salvation, creation and redemption have always gone together. It's only we who've lived in the last five centuries that have separated these from one another. I think about creation and redemption as a DNA molecule, right? It's a double helix. You can denature it with acid or heat, and it becomes separated and inactive, but you can bring it back together. So what's happened 500, I think, the last 500 years is that creation and redemption got separated. Creation gets reduced to nature, and that's what scientists study. So redemption is left, and that's what people do in church. They worship God, and they celebrate the Eucharist. And so people who do that in church inside are disconnected from those who are studying the outside world. And now they no longer have anything to say to one another. This becomes New Age stuff if you start trying to connect creation with, with worshiping God. Right? Or it's pantheism. or it's, well, That's what the scientists do, so we should reject it because it's not, it's not godly. So I think what the various popes of the last decades have been trying to do is to bring these two things back together, to re-anneal creation and redemption. And it's there in Colossians 1. It's there in John chapter 1. Everything's created in and through the word of God. That word becomes incarnate of the Logos, the Redeemer. Creation and redemption always go together. 
And I think we, how can that help us interpret scripture? That this isn't just about redemption. There's, there's aspects of how God's first gift is his creation. The first gift of love is the created world. So what are some obstacles to this contemplation of nature? I've mentioned this nature deficit disorder. We're just not, many of us just don't even operate in the world. We, we live in, we have highways and freeways and we go by things at 90 miles an hour and it's just, we don't see things. So I think one obstacle is just our attentiveness to things. St. Basil the Great wrote back in the fourth century homilies on creation and he wanted to wean his audience from going to scurrilous plays and horse races and to draw them out into the God's amphitheater of creation. So here's my modern image of what I think Basil would say today. I think this is what draws the attention of most of our culture are things like this, right? Um, we'd rather look at this than go out and look at plants or ostracods. <laughs> so there's that practical aspect. St. Basil the Great says, I want creation to penetrate you with so much admiration that the smallest plant might give you a remembrance of the creator. How, how are we looking for those things? How are our eyes opened? Rather than walking around with our, our head in our, in our phone all the time. So that's the practical aspects, but there's also an intellectual aspect to this. So now we're gonna move into the epistemology aspect, and this is, Corey Hayes has already set some of this up, and as other speakers have this, this week. So let's just talk about what these different types of knowing, or as St. Thomas Aquinas calls them, different types of wisdom. So there's science, philosophy, and theology. As Stephen Bard indicated, the Latin word scientia just means knowledge. We've reduced knowledge to just scientia, just to science, right? Science is a particular type now, biology, physics, chemistry, that's science. So Thomas Aquinas, in talking about science, is that it's a subset of reality. Biology studies a subset, chemistry a subset, physics subset, he uses the example of architecture. But if you know all the principles of architecture, you will become a wise architect. You know all the principles of it, so you'll be a wise architect. Right? There's a domain and range to what science studies. It's measurable, it's observable, it's quantifiable. Right? God is not part of science. Science cannot know anything about God by definition. It's not part of the domain and range of what science studies. What experiment are you going to do to say anything about God? Next is philosophy, right? Literally, the love of wisdom, philosophia, sophia wisdom, philo love of. This is the knowledge, the science of all things from the point of view of the highest cause or the last cause, just through the light of natural reason. It looks at the totality of things. Why is there a universe at all? Why is there something rather than nothing? These are all philosophical questions. We can also get into moral aspects here. Right? What's it mean to be a good person? Right? So you can be a wise person here. You're more than just a wise architect. You could be a real scoundrel and be a wise architect, but this will teach you how to be a wise person. And then theology, we run into a, we enter a different realm of, we now get into the realm of revelation. The first two deal only with, with reason, so to speak, Theology deals with, with revelation. So I'll just pick on this person in the front row who's wearing a red shirt. And we might add, what's your name? Christine. Christine. We could say, well, we've been following Christine all week, and maybe she's worn red every week, every day, I don't know. But we could observe her, like, maybe is red her favorite color? Well, maybe that's the school that she goes to, and that's their school colors. Or maybe there's some other reason for... Wait, we can't, through reason alone, come to know if that's her favorite color. There's only one way to know for sure, with certainty, and that, well, maybe it's not even certain, and that's what we'd have to ask her. And then we'd have to believe her. She reveals something to us, and we have to receive it in faith. There's no other way to know the truth of what her favorite color is, except through revelation and its reception in faith. So it's the same with God. God reveals certain things that we can't know by reason, and we have to receive that in faith. And in fact, I think it's faith that enables reason to actually happen. Most of what we, we know comes from what people have told us, and we believe them to be true. So most of what we know comes from faith. St. Augustine will say, faith enables reason. We only know who our father is because we believe what our mother tells us. Right? Faith, we believe our mother. So 
I think in thinking about the relationship between science and faith, we have to understand what these three categories are. And we start confusing these categories, we enter into the realm of conflict between them. We'll start to look at statements that scientists make. And is it a scientific statement that they're claiming as a scientist, or is it really a philosophical statement in scientific guise? So how do we distinguish what kind of statement something is? So let's use an example. So this comes from my textbook in evolutionary biology that I used here as an undergrad many years ago. Doug Futima uh, is in New York. Let's just look at the bottom part. Least of all, despite popular conceptions, can evolution be conceived of as being directed toward the emergence of the human species? And that's part of what we've looked at with the Ratzinger homilies. Homily number three in particular deals with, deals with this question. Is this a scientific statement? Because this is what evolutionary biology would tell us. That we're, we're not a part of this. We're, there's no intention. There's no point. There's no direction to, to evolution. Right? We're, we came about through natural selection and chance alone. So there's, there's no um, direction. Or there's no up above. There's no purpose to us. And I don't think this is a properly scientific statement. And let's just take this in relationship with the next one by George G. Simpson, paleontologist. The meaning of evolution. We are the result of a purposeless and materialistic process that does not have us in mind. We were not planned. So I know Dr. Dan will talk about this tomorrow. And we can talk about how do we think about what is our place here in the universe? We've come about through an evolutionary process. And the chance is involved in that. Does that mean that we're not intended? Just some other Jacques Monod. Ratzinger draws upon him in his fourth homily, or third homily. He mentions this uh, biologist by name. And basically he says, we've won the Monte Carlo game. We, we're, it's just by luck that we're here. We should, be, we should rejoice for that. We should, we should feel strange and unreal for having won this, won this lottery. Right? So how, somehow there's a contradiction between chance and purpose. Or statements from some of the new atheists, Daniel Dennett and Darwin, or Dawkins, right? There's no, if you believe in... Evolution, if you think evolution's true, then there's no belief in God disappears in any sense of purpose. There's just DNA and we dance to its music. Or the popular Stephen Jay Gold argument, play the tape again and we wouldn't come about because of all these contingencies. I'll just mention this because I don't want to take anything away from Dan's talk tomorrow, but Corey's already mentioned Simon Conway Morris and convergent evolution. Right? There are certain limitations to the way that nature seems to work. And it comes upon similar um, solutions. Thank you. So if, we, if there is intelligent life on other planets, what does this do to statements that, that these authors have made? Or what if, the life is, what if the universe is full of life? Does that mean there's not some kind of directionality toward intelligent species? Right now, we have no law of life. We just have one datum point. And you can't run any statistical tests with just one datum point, right? There's no degrees of freedom. So we have no law of life. We just have one instance of life on this planet. So I like the example of a casino. If you want to make money, be guaranteed of making money, would you rather play the casino or own the casino? Um. You want to own the casino because by purpose, you're going to make money off of these games of chance. Right? And as Corey said, games, chance is always nested within some higher framework and understanding. It's the rules of the game that give meaning to the rules of the dice. It's not the rules of the dice that have a meaningless existence. Right? It's the rules of the game. And it's gonna, that, the purpose of a casino is to make money. So it's not by chance, so to speak, if you get the pun there. It's not by chance that casinos make money, though it is by games of chance that they do. So the International Theological Commission and this would be the providential aspect. God is the governor and ruler of the universe who guides all things from beginning to end and whole and part. So many neo-Darwinian scientists conclude that if a relatively contingent materialistic process driven by natural selection and random genetic innovation, there could be no providential causality. But according to the Catholic faith is that the understanding of divine causality, true contingency in the created order is not incompatible with the purposeful divine providence. God can use chance. God can use contingency to bring about the effects that he wants. 
which comes out the next paragraph, if you look on the right, divine causality can be active in the process that's both contingent and guided. I threw this in just before the talk, after, after Corey's talk, because I wanted to at least address some of the things that he had talked about with a specific example of what we're up against with, with evolution, and to give us some, a little more flesh, flesh to it. Then in God's providence, he can use, God did not only the cause of all things, but he's the cause of the manner in which they happen whether it's by chance or by necessity or by contingency. I'll skip over that one. So that's all the introductory stuff. How do we know things? Epistemology, science, philosophy, theology. What kind of statement is someone making? And is that proper to their domain? Or are they exceeding their boundaries of what they, what they can say? So now I want to switch and talk about God, because I think if we get our notion of who God is correct, it overcomes so many of these claims of conflict. And this is what Corey was emphasizing in his talk about. If we get right about who God is, so much disappears. And that's why this primary and secondary causation is so important. So I'm going to approach it in a, in a somewhat different way, though, though similar, uh, connected way that Corey did. So let's talk about the creator and creation. So here's a stained glass window from a church... 30 miles from Undurk. This is actually in, in Boulder Junction, Wisconsin, so just 30 miles from Notre Dame's biology field station. This is St. Anne's Catholic Church. This is a huge stained glass window at the front when you walk in. And there's the Trinity, and there's all the natural organisms that you would see of the North Woods with birch trees and loons and eagles, bald eagles and, and hills and lots of water. They should have big mosquitoes here as well. <laughs> lots of mosquitoes up there. What would you take away from this if you were worshiping in this church? You're celebrating the Eucharist, and you've got the Trinity here. You've got the sun and the moon and, and the stars up in the, uh, up in the sky. What might that do to your relationship of how creation and redemption fit together? How do we think about God? So there's the church. So let's look at these two. I'm going to spend some time thinking about this. Because this all of our students are intrigued by this question. How do we put these two stories together? So on the left-hand side is the story of the Big Bang. And when you see All Creation Gives Praise tomorrow, look for this little disc here, because that'll become very prominent in the, in the, in the program tomorrow. Right, we're probably, I don't know, where are you? Maybe we're already out here. What, how is this story told? Well, it's through matter and energy. It's forces of nature. It's impersonal. It's true. I think this is true, right? The best of what we understand, this is the true account of, of the natural origins of our, of our world. But what is this not telling us? What story is not being told in this? So if you take this in your physics class, are they going to talk about family units, political systems, economic life, culture, humans? Are humans a part of this story? Well, we, we are, but we're not, right? You don't tell the Big Bang story and talk about humans necessarily. So this is, this is an impersonal story. So it's not, it's not the whole story. On the right-hand side, this is from the Cathedral in Monona, Minnesota, Sacred Heart. And it's the six days of creation, mostly distinct. So day one, two, three, four, five with a part of six, because the lions are on day six, and then day six with the humans. So it's, it's the seven days, or six days of creation from Genesis chapter one. What is this story telling us? It's not telling us 13.7 billion years. It's saying seven days. We we'll have to talk about that. But the main takeaway from this story is it's telling us that God's the creator. We don't learn that from the Big Bang story. So God's the creator. Humans are very much a part of this story. Right? We're made in God's image and likeness. Another main takeaway from this story that is so very important especially today, is that this universe is good. Seven times in this account, one of which is very good, the universe is said to be good. We don't learn that from this. We don't learn that from the Big Bang story. And in fact, we can't. Because can science tell us what's good or bad, good or evil? Those aren't scientific categories. We're now in the realm of philosophy, Right? Morality, goodness, evil, right? those aren't scientific categories. So there's nothing in science that can tell us this is a good world. There's something significantly missing from the Big Bang story.
So why seven? Why seven days? It's a week. Why a week? Why tell a story with the context of a week? Where does the week come from? As far as we know, the Jews were the first to give us a week. We have no evidence of a Mesopotamian antecedent calendar of a week before Jewish, the Jewish calendar. And there's no evidence for the Greek planetary week right before this Hellenistic times. So as far as we understand, the week comes to us from the Jews. Now, when is this story being written? We think it's being written in the 6th century BC. It's in, in contrast to the story of Marduk and Tiamat and Numa Elish that's told and recited out loud every, every New Year's festival in April. And so the Jews would be listening to this every year for 50 years. They'd hear this story of bloodshed and violence creating the universe. And so the Jewish writers write this as a response. God creates out of his word, out of his wisdom, his love, his order, his reason. It's not violence. How many times does scripture say, and then God said? Well, it's 10. One might immediately think of the Ten Commandments. There's a connection between the way we live our lives in relationship to one another in God, right, our moral life, and how we live our life in creation. Creation and redemption go together. There's something about the rhythm of a week that's being, um, right, it enters into our own body. This rhythm of the universe is entering into us. So why a week? So the Jews, formative for them is the, is the covenant that God has made with them at Sinai, the Exodus event, freedom from, from Egypt. They have that first, and then they tell their story of creation. What have they been doing for centuries is they've been celebrating the Sabbath every Saturday. Every seventh day, they're celebrating the Sabbath. And so they're telling their story of creation from a liturgical perspective. Creation and redemption go together. We can't understand this story apart from what they're doing in their liturgy. If we think about the, the sun and the moon, right? those words are not mentioned in Scripture, in this, this account, right? The, the greater light and the lesser light because the words that were used in Hebrew were the names of Canaanite gods, so they, want, they don't want to use that. And what do they do? They mark the seasons, the days, and the years. They don't mark the months. The Babylonians had a monthly calendar, and they worshiped the moon with this moon gods. The 52 weeks, the Jews have a calendar that's based on a week and not on months, and so they're not worshiping deities other than the one God. Seven occurs throughout this story. In Hebrew, the first verse has seven words. The second verse has 14 words. Chapter two, verse one to three has 35 words, all multiples of seven. The whole account, one, one to two, three, has 469 words. That's seven times 67. God saw that it was good seven times, 21 times the earth is mentioned, 35 times God is mentioned. Seven is important throughout and it's all because of this week, I think, this liturgical week that they're celebrating. Enuma Elish is a cosmogony. Goni means the origin of. So the origin of the cosmos. So Genesis 1 and Enuma Elish are both cosmogonies. They're telling us where the cosmos comes from. Enuma Elish is a theogony. It's also telling us where all these little gods come from, but Genesis 1 is not a theogony, right? There's just one God. What I think Genesis 1 really is, is a sabbatogony. It's about where the Sabbath comes from. I think that's the prime aspect of God as the creator who's entered into a relationship, a covenant with his people and of humanity and the importance of the Sabbath. I think that's ultimately what this story is about creation and redemption. So let's think about this a little bit more and turn to the book of Exodus. So here's the high priest for the Jewish people. If you remember the tabernacle that they used for 40 years while they're in the desert, they moved it around from place to place. The first part is the holy place with the showbread and the menorah and the altar of incense, and then there's the second curtain, and then there's the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant is with the Ten Commandments inside. And only once a year did the high priest go into the Holy of Holies. 
There's a direct connection between the seven days of creation and the story of the account of God telling Moses how to make this thing. So here's a a comparison between the six days, seven days of creation story and then Exodus 25 to 40. And just see the parallels. So each of those seven days, if you go to Exodus 25 to 31, there are seven speeches of Moses, they all begin with the Lord said to Moses. And if you follow through those, those are going to parallel each of the seven days of creation. And then you can just see God saw everything, Moses saw everything, the heavens were finished, tabernacles finished, and so on. So what people like Scott Hahn and Peter Kearney and others reflect upon is that this is indicating that the creation, Genesis 1, is about it's God's creation and dedication of a cosmic temple for a royal priestly people. That just as what people do in the, in the tent, worshiping God, right? we've got a relationship to God in and through the natural world. Right? There's a connection. Creation and redemption go together. So let's think about our place. And this is getting into some of the things that Rotzinger talks about in his homilies. You have this story of evolution and the story of Genesis 2. Genesis 1, how do they fit together? So here's the, our phylogeny of, of the anthropoid primates. Right? So we're connected to all these things, a lot of anatomical and physiological similarities between us. So here's, just like we had Genesis 1 with the Big Bang, here's Genesis 2 and our evolutionary history. Right? So here's God creating Adam and Eve, and there's a relationship that we have with God, our own self, with others in the natural world. One thing about, one side note about art and how art can affect us, right? It's usually in the Western world, Adam and Eve have been depicted as Caucasians. Now, we know that the first humans were not Caucasians, right? They were African. <laughs> Homo sapiens arose in Africa. So what would it do to us to have a different vision of who Adam and Eve were? And what might that do to our race relationships? Right, so here's Adam and Eve from Newsweek back in the 90s, I think it is. But there's a cathedral in Gallup, New Mexico that also has it, so it's... it's Mary, and then here's Adam and Eve, enlarged over here as, as African, with African features. So how do we understand our evolutionary past and our being made in the image and likeness of God? How do those go together? So I like this image. It's, this is a stained glass window from the cathedral in Pittsburgh. And it's, it's Jacob's ladder. And I think this is a wonderful depiction of, of being made in the image and likeness of God. Right? When you look in a mirror, you're immediately connected to your image. Right? You can't separate them. We're made in God's image. So there's a direct connection between us and, who, and God. Right? We're his image. And that ladder represents that connection. Right? The angels ascending and descending upon that ladder. There's an intrinsic connection. We can't understand who the human person is properly without understanding who God is. Jesus Christ identifies himself as that ladder in John's gospel. He says to Nathaniel, you'll see greater things than this. You'll see the angels of God descending and ascending upon the Son of Man. He is the Son of Man, right? Jesus is that ladder. He is truly human and truly divine. He is that connection between humanity and divinity. To understand who we truly are, we have to understand who Christ is. So Ratzinger will tell the story in his, in his homily about the theory of evolution can tell us about our historical origins, Right, how things changed over time. But it doesn't tell us what Rothinger says is the great project that God has for us about our inmost origin, our particular nature, nature what it means to be human. Right, so these are two elements. We want to learn about where we come from. Historically, we have to look to evolution. But if we know who we are, we look to God to find out who we are. We look to Jesus Christ. We're not just the result of chance and error. Right? There's a creating intelligence and reason that's creating us. And if we tie this into the, what we looked at early with providence and chance and how all that works over time, right? God's guiding everything to its end that he wants. And he can use chance and contingency to do it. Right. So that's kind of the nature of creation. Let's talk about the creator himself. Who is God? This is Moses the burning bush. This is from the Trenton Cathedral. We learn God's divine name, I am who am. It's connected to God as being itself philosophically. 
So let's just do it. I was trained as a taxonomist, like to identify things. So just imagine that this room is the universe. I'm not sure what the windows on the doors indicate, but maybe that's part of the multiverse. I don't know. So I'll just say this room is the universe. And we're going to make a catalog of everything in this room. So there's a microphone, there's a Yeti, there's chairs, there's pointers, there's people, there's cameras, there's oxygen. Is God on our list? Is God another thing in the room? I'm going to say no, because God's not a thing. God's not a thing at all. God's not a noun. If God's anything, he's more of a verb than he is a noun. Um, we all have being. All these things have being. This microphone has being. But God doesn't have being. He is being. He's being itself. And there's God who is being, and God gives and bestows being to something. That's what we call creation, the bestowal of existence. And everything depends upon, as we learned, everything depends upon God for existence. So as Aquinas says, right, creation is a relationship, a dependence upon God for existence. Everything that exists depends upon God. So if you see something that exists, it directly points to the creator. And that's the whole foundation of this sacramental principle, why we can contemplate nature as creation, read it as the book of nature. It's pointing to God. Everything depends upon God at every moment. But God is not another thing. He transcends this reality. So let's think about, I use this, this is an abbreviated version of what I use in my class to talk about different types of ways to think about God. God's transcendence and God's imminence. Right, so if you think about Genesis 1, that's God's transcendence. He, he's the creator. He doesn't appear, or he's just a voice that speaks out. Right? He's, through his word, he creates. Right? He, he's above reality, material created reality. And then imminence is more Genesis chapter 2. God is in creation, in a sense, right? He walks around, he's anthropomorphic, right? There's, there's a closeness to God. That's more than that. But. So deism is the view, right? Think of the Thomas Jefferson. This is the view of God creates the world. He's completely transcendent. But he's uninvolved. He's unconcerned. He creates it, and then he goes and watches, you know, Netflix. He's unconcerned about the world. But he's the creator who sets it up and lets it go, right? That's deism. The converse of that would be pantheism, where God is not transcendent at all. God is only imminent. Pantheism, pan means all, theism, God. Everything is God. God is the universe. The universe is God. God is the tree. The tree is God. Right? There's nothing transcendent about God. He's not really even the creator. He's, he's, he and the universe are, are coterminous. He, he is it. The traditional classical view of theism is the middle one, that God is both transcendent and imminent. The creator of the universe is such a kind of being that God is in everything through his power, his presence, his essence. God creates, in a sense, from the inside out. He's continually giving us being. God's closer to us than we are to ourselves or to anything, right? He, he's in everything. That doesn't mean the ostracod is divine, but the divine presence is in that thing. So transcendence and imminence. God just doesn't have power to create. We have to think about another way to think about God. And let's go to the creed. So on the right-hand side is the English translation, I, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty. So let's look at this word, almighty. The Latin translation would be omnipotentum, right? Om omnipotence, all-powerful. And that just gives you a sense of God has power to do stuff. But God's more than just all-powerful. The original Greek in the green is Pantocrator, the Pantocrator. See, I have a spelling? Oh, up at the top. Yeah, Pantocrator. This is probably the most common title, identity for God in John's book of Revelation. God's the Pantocrator. This has a sense of not just being all powerful, but being the ruler, the guide, the governor, one who's involved. You could be omnipotent and be a deistic God. The Christian God, the Jewish God, is involved in the world. Right? It governs and guides things. God is providential. So I don't think we can... So we lose that sense just with the word almighty. But the Greek has the sense of God is very much involved in things. God governs and is active. He's not remote. He's imminent and transcendent. So 
So how can we talk about this God who's not another thing? And I think this is important for when we're going to try and unravel claims of conflict when some scientist like Richard Dawkins claims, well, God doesn't exist. Well, what kind of God does he have in mind? Because I don't believe in a lot of the gods that Dawkins doesn't believe in either. So let's look at these three terms. Just how do we use English, our, our language? How do we speak about things? So univocal language is when you use some term, you use it identically across every instance. So you go to the grocery store, and you go to the produce section, and you want to buy some fruit. So you can get grapes, bananas, apples, oranges, kiwis, watermelon, tomatoes or fruits, technically. Right? We use the word fruit identically across all instances. That's univocal speech. Equivocal is where you use a term, but it has a diverse meaning across instances. So let's do this by example. I'm going to say a word. You think of what comes to mind, and then we'll share what word, what, what, what thing you thought of. It's a three-letter word, nut, N-U-T. All right, so a crazy person. That's usually not the first one that comes out, but crazy person. <laughs> Walnut. Walnuts, so botanical nuts, something you eat. The tools. the tools, right, hardware store. All different types of nuts. One word, but diverse meanings. And this can cause confusion in our speech. If we think we're thinking about one, but we're actually talking about another, or it can be the cause of humor when you realize, oh, that's what you're talking, you need laughter. And then analogical language is where you use a term, but it has a partly similar, partly dissimilar meaning. So like health, we can talk about human health, we can talk about health food. We have a sense of what health food is, but health food, food is not healthy in the same way that a human being is healthy. So that term health is used analogically to talk about health food. It's partly similar, but partly dissimilar. So how do we use this to talk about God? We have to move away from univocal speech. When we talk about being, God's being, our being, most people, and even Christians, have a sense that God's just like us. God's just another thing in the world, just bigger and more powerful. Right? Another thing in the world. We put God in our list. Now, we could put Jesus Christ in this list because he's, he's humanity as a creature created. So we have to move away from univocal speech. If we see someone talking about God as another thing in the world, that's going to lead to competition between divine causes and natural causes. God's just another thing. But that's not who God is. That's not the Christian God. We just should avoid equivocal language about God because if, we, if we're talking about God as one thing and it's completely different, then we can't even talk about God at all. So we have to use analogical language to talk about God, partly similar, partly dissimilar. Every similarity with God, there's a greater dissimilarity the councils talk about. So here's, I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, Creator. I hear this from the Creed. But God is not just one. God's three, right? It's the Trinity who creates. They create as one principle. Let's just talk about wisdom. God creates in and through his wisdom. We had this on the Sunday homily, the Proverbs reading. Sophia is there when God's creating everything. So God creates in and through his wisdom, and that wisdom is connected to Jesus Christ. So that's Solomon, right? A great gift of wisdom given to him. And Solomon studied the natural world. If you read the book of Wisdom, chapter 7, he's studying physics and botany and pharmacology and all sorts of the sciences, natural philosophy of his day. And it's not an obstacle to his belief in God. It's, it's, it's part of his belief in God, is, is studying what God's creation. Wisdom has created all this. And he has the wisdom to be able to understand it. So it's no way an obstacle. So if we look at the wisdom literature... When Christianity comes on the scene, when Christ comes and people start thinking about who Jesus is after his resurrection, they say, all these things that are said about wisdom apply to who Jesus is. So just to, um, I'll just throw this up here. So Sophia from the Old Testament, all these things are said about Sophia, but they're also said about the Logos in John's Gospel. Here's instances in the wisdom literature where some of those instances occur. So the Logos Christology is, is connected to a to a wisdom Christology. Christians are going to identify Lady Wisdom with Jesus Christ, with wisdom. Now, we all sing this every Advent. What's the second verse of O Come, Come, Emmanuel? O come, thou wisdom from on high, and order all things far and nigh, wisdom 8.1, and to us the path of knowledge show and teach us in her ways to go. This wisdom that we're expecting is Jesus Christ. He is that wisdom of God. So we sing it we sing it every Advent. So that 8 1 is here's, indeed, she spans the world from end to end mightily and governs all things well. 
The center of our campus is the statue of the Sacred Heart, Venite ad me omnes, is at the bottom. Come to me, all of you. It comes from Matthew's Gospel. All you who are weary and burdened, take my yoke upon you. It's a reference to wisdom saying the very same thing. Take my yoke and learn from me. Right? So Jesus is the wisdom of God. How are we doing on time? Just speed things up here. All right, so divine and natural causation. I think Corey and Steve have talked about this. I'll just give my... If you stayed along around campus for a week or two longer, the basswoods are going to start blooming, and it's an amazing aroma if you've ever smelled basswoods. People who say the best honey comes from the bees that, that get the pollen and nectar from, from basswoods. What causes this basswood tree to, to flower next week or the week after? We could study that botanically as a secondary cause. We can know that would be 100% the cause of that basswood tree flowering. Does that mean that God's not the cause of that basswood tree flowering? No, God's 100% the cause of that tree flowering. Remember, it's not part, part. Things in this world, if somebody came up and helped me move this podium, it's really heavy. You do your part, I do my part. You do 80, I do 20. Right? We, we could move it across the stage. <laughs> I'm older, you're younger. Um, right? Primary and secondary cognition is whole, whole, 100%, 100%, but at different metaphysical levels. So God's the 100% the cause of that tree flowering. But the tree is 100% the cause of it, of it flowering. God is enabling that tree to do what it does. Now, Steve Barr uses uh, Hamlet and Polonius. I like to use Harry Potter. <laughs> so Harry Potter, he flies through in the seventh book. He rescues Draco Malfoy from this fire in the room of requirement. He's 100% the cause of rescuing Harry Potter. J.K. Rowling wrote the story. She's 100% the cause of, of the rescue of, of Draco Malfoy. They're not in competition with one another. She enables Harry to do what he does, right? So 100% cause, right? Author and, and character. But J.K. Rowling appears nowhere in this, but she's imminent in it everywhere. She causes the rain to fall. She causes the mandrakes to shriek. She causes brooms to fly, right? She causes everything to happen, but she's not anywhere in it that you can see as a secondary cause. She's the primary cause of everything happening. So now let's get to, to evolution. When you go to Jordan Hall for the All Creation Gives Praise performance tomorrow, go south of it and walk in, if it's open, and walk down the Galleria, and you'll see these, there's three medallions that are repeated, one for biology, one for chemistry, one for physics. The biology one here, it has a DNA double, mo DNA double helix, that's creation and redemption going together. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> and then it has around the outside, Theodosius Dubzanski, 1972, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. It's an article by this man, Theodosius Dubzanski, his orthodox Christian background. He's part of the modern synthesis back in the 30s, his geneticist, population geneticist, where Darwin got put on, why well, Darwinian evolution got put on solid ground with embryology, genetics, paleontology, all that made the modern synthesis that is Darwinism as we know it today. The importance of evolution. And so this article just goes through, and I'll just fly through this because I assume everybody here knows about evolution, right? How you can explain homologous limb structures across organisms, why this, why this bone is, is evolutionary connected to the wing of a bat and a dolphin, dolphin forelimb, right? They're not separate, they have a common evolutionary ancestor. Why present day mammals or organisms are related to the fossils of that area. Why do whales have femurs? Right, evolution can help explain that. They evolved from some land animal that's related to cows back in the day. And this is a pitcher plant, right, carnivorous plants. There's a type of mosquito, Wyomaya smithii, that lives only in the water that's in a pitcher plant. What can account for those kind of adaptations? Right, through natu natural selection can explain these things. Or biogeography, why are certain animals in certain places over, over time and across space? And so plate tectonics and natural selection can account for why there be these distributions of organisms across, across, the, across the globe. Evolution can take care, ex put that into a coherent whole. Everything with DNA and RNA, right? common ancestor. And all that is part of this article by Dubjansky. So now I want to talk about Paley. And you're probably familiar with Paley. He's what's called a physico theologian. These were back in the 19th century. Scientists and the theologians who thought about God through the natural world. And so he has the famous watchmaker argument, right? So here's a, you come across 
the forest and you come across a pocket watch. This is my great-grandfather's pocket watch. And unlike a stone that you might find, you could say, okay, that's there by weathering or somebody, it's, it's earthquake happened and it split apart. What would account for this thing? So you've, you come from some pre-technical culture and you, you've never seen something like this before, right? He said that you look at this and it, it, you might be able to deduce that it's actually telling time. It's got some kind of purpose to it, but it's, it, it's got a complexity to it. And it's got a design to it that indicates that there's a, there's a clock maker, that this just didn't come about through natural means. It required an artificial, an artificer to make it, right? So his, his argument is this, when we respect the watch, we see that it's, its purpose, we tinker with it, and we get the parts out of order, it's not gonna work. So at the very end, he'll say, an artificer who formed it for the purpose with which we find it, who comprehended its construction and designed its use, right? The complexity and design points to the designer. So he applies this to organisms and even to the universe, right? Organisms are so complex and designed, they must have a designer, a creator. A God who made it. I don't like this argument. I, re I really don't like it. I reject it. I think it's wrong. And so did a lot of people. Hume, Darwin, Richard Dawkins today. And I think they're all right that we should reject this argument. So I just want to talk about what are some of the background, what's, what's the context in which Paley's making this argument? So first, let's think about which of these two entities is the true automobile? Auto meaning self, mobile meaning moving. Which is the true self-moving thing? It's the Jaguar on the right, not the Jaguar on the left. That's actually a Jaguar car. I looked it up. Right, so it's, <laughs> see what I did there? See what I did? So it's this Jaguar, the animal Jaguar, that's self-moving. So what, what Paley is doing is he's beholden to a Cartesian view of reality. So what Descartes does, right, Rene Descartes, is he's taken organisms that Aristotle would say you need matter and form. There's jaguars, the animals, are self-directed. They, they act towards some end, right? There's a final cause that's, that they're directed. There's teleology. There's an end to them. Once we get to Descartes, he separates living organisms and he makes them into machines. There's no longer any end directedness to a machine. It's inert stuff. So for Aristotle, the basic units of reality were living organisms, an elephant, a jaguar, humans, right? There's not matter as we understand it today. Matter is always informed by something. For Descartes, we get the periodic table in a sense, right? Matter is just inert stuff. And stuff doesn't do anything at all, it's just stuff. You have to make the car. The car doesn't make itself. That's what Paley has in mind, is what organisms have become. Well, you're gonna need a mechanic or some kind of construction engineer to make that car on the left. You have to give it purpose. It has to come from the outside. So if you see an organism that's really now just a machine, you need an external agent to make it. So contemporaries of his, Robert Boyle, right, founder of modern chemistry, Boyle's Law, and his assistant, Robert Hooke, they were of this view that you could use the natural world and its design and its complexity to point to God. It was very much in the air. Design was been one of the best arguments to convince us that there is a God. But it's all conditioned on this Cartesian view of reality, I think. Beyond that, as emeritus philosophy of biology professor Phil Sloan here at Notre Dame, from what I've read of his and talked to him about this, he says this is all based not on a Christian view of reality, but a stoic one. Christians, we're not looking for some particular part of reality to point us to God. We just have to look at something that is. When we wake up in the morning, we, we get our senses, we should give thanks and praise to God because everything around us is. And it wouldn't be there if God weren't giving it being right now. The sacramental vision that I'm trying to give my students through the Tree and the Moon Project is that everything that is gives us this sacramental vision to point to God. Everything does, not just the particular things, not just a particular designed aspect of creation. It's not the, it's not the design, it's the, it's the being. But for the Stoics, they were materialistic. There's matter, and what organizes matter is, is nature, capital N, nature. And so 
Christians, in a sense, are taking over unwittingly this stoic idea of God now becomes the organizing principle of inert matter. But it takes us far afield from creation, and creation itself just points to God. Paley's designer is essentially anthropomorphic. He's reduced God to a mechanic. He's now a secondary cause in the world. He's now another thing in the world. Mechanics operate and push and pull metal. And now that's what God is doing to bring about these organisms. He's reduced God from the primary cause to a secondary cause. And now you can be in competition. Because now Dar Paley's going to say, God creates this watch. God creates this jaguar, this elephant, this ostracod. There's no natural cause for it. Because if you have a divine cause, you don't need a natural cause. Well, that leads, lends itself, we've talked about the God of the gaps. Because we're going to have someone like Hume in 1776. Now, this is pre-Darwin, who says, well, matter may contain the source or spring of order originally within itself. What if matter has the kind of properties that can bring these things about? And that's what Darwin's going to come up with, with natural selection. This is the way that nature works. Natural selection, chance, working together. You can produce adaptations. You can produce fleet of foot deer to escape the, the jaguars. And so now we have a natural cause. And what's happened to the divine cause? We've just eliminated it. We filled in that gap with nature, a natural cause, and we no longer have the divine cause because now God is a univocal being in the world pushing and pulling as a secondary cause. That's why I don't like this argument. It's a God of the gaps argument. It's a univocal view of God. And I don't think that's who God is. Richard Dawkins goes a step farther and says, because we have a natural cause, there is no God. Right? He'll be explicit about it. He, like Paley, has this sense of divine and natural causes are in competition. He has a univocal view of God. And if you read any of his works, this is his view of God. Zeus, Thor, Apollo, Mother Goose, the flying spaghetti monster, Odin. And all these gods have in common is that they're things in the world. They're not being itself. They're univocal things like us, just more powerful or cuter or whatever. You evaluate some of these things. Right? Dawkins is in no way critiquing the Christian God. I don't believe in any of these gods either. So the intelligent design movement. And I'm glad that I think when Steve talked about it and maybe Corey talked about it, they used the word movement. I think every Christian should think that the world is intelligent design, right? It's through God's logos. But the intelligent design movement is a particular way to think about reality. It's saying that there are biological processes or structures that are so irreducibly complex that they couldn't have come about in a stepwise natural selection process. They could only be designed by some intelligent designer like God. I think this is just Paley in the 21st century. It's reducing God to another thing in the world. So I want to show a little video. Charger on three quarters power. And I'll start running laps. Hopefully this looks with familiar to you. Did you Corvette. have the supercharger? I had the supercharger. 6D batteries. And it Later, turns a I'll turbine and keeps that Corvette car going around this, into the this track. Close. All right. So that's. So my question for you, as it is for, oh no. No. Is that the way the world works? Does the world need superchargers to keep it going? Do basswood trees, in order to flower, do they need something to come in from outside to make it flower? Do they need some kind of intervention from God? And I think that's what intelligent design is. They have a supercharger view of the world, that God has to come in and do what nature is not capable of doing. Microtubules of flagellum, this is one of the examples that, that is used. Well, scientists can come up with various hypotheses for why and how microtubules might have evolved. All of a sudden, we've just reduced God now 
to nothing. We filled in that gap that's been filled with God now with the natural cause. Natural causes and, and divine causes are in competition. What this gets rid of is the wisdom of God to order all things well, for nature to act according to as, as, as it does. So I think the intelligent design movement is just paley, and it's the bad paley argument of a univocal view of God where primary and secondary causes are, are in competition. There is no primary cause. There's God is, is a secondary cause. He's been reduced to that level. So we talked about the new atheists. We talked about Dawkins. In some ways, he's not much different than the old atheists. So I want to draw upon an older confer of mine, Father John Zom, whom Steve, I think Steve Barr mentioned. His, his birthday was yesterday, 1851. He died in 1921 or so. And he wrote a book in, 19, in 1896 called Evolution and Dogma. Now, it had to be taken out of circulation by the, by the Vatican, but for reasons other really than evolution. It had to do with Americanism. But there he is with Teddy Roosevelt. He was, so this is, he writes about the atheist of his day. And this will be my, my final thing, or just his comments about atheism of his day. Right, it is announced with a lot of flourish that materialist, anarchist, and atheist world over, there is no God, because science has demonstrated there's no longer any reason for God. Right, it presumes that divine and natural causes are in the same plane, and they're in competition with one another. A glance at the works of Heckel, Vogt and Buchner, the atheists of the day, is sufficient to prove how radical and rabid are the views of these advanced thinkers. They conclude, forsooth, that they understand how a thing is done, that if they understand how a thing is done, God didn't do it. If they can but just glimpse a, get a glimpse of the wheels, it's divine character. If we have a mechanism, we have a natural cause, we don't need a divine cause. Right? It presumes that primary and secondary causation are, God is univocal. He just goes on to talk about their antagonism. We could talk about, this is, he could have written this about Dawkins and the new atheist. But he also responds to the physical theologians, to Paley and his group. To Paley, as to the older school of natural or physical theologians, God was the direct cause of all that exists. He's not doing it through secondary causes. God has to do it directly. He has to make the automobile. He has to make the jaguar. To the evolutionist, God is the cause of causes, of the world and all it contains. God administers the material universe by natural laws and not by constant miraculous interventions. God's not using superchargers to make basswood trees flower. Nature does it. God's created nature to do what it does. So I think if we can get straight our epistemology, science, philosophy, theology, keep them in their proper brackets, if we understand who God is as, as being itself and as the primary cause that enables secondary causes, I think those are the two main things, along with scriptural interpretation, that will reduce these claims of conflict, and we can see how science and faith go together. So thank you, and I'll take questions.